Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. I've asked Anya Cezadla, who was my guest last week, to come back so we can continue our conversation about the Middle East. Anya is a very busy freelance writer who's based in Beirut. She covers the Middle East and writes for the Christian Science Monitor, The Nation, National Journal, New Republic, and even some other publications, so you can see how busy she really is. We were talking about uh, a lot about Iraq and what life is like living in these cities that are so besieged with terrorism and violence. And, um, and a little bit about Beirut, and you've talked a lot about a revolution in Beirut, and that was when the prime minister, was that, what did you call it? It was a, revo what revolution was it? Did it have a name? Um, well, the, the, the Cedar Revolution, <laughs> but Cedar. That, that's actually, that name was given by the U.S. State Department. Oh. In, uh, in, in Beirut, in, in Lebanon, what they call it is the Independence Intifada. Um, which means uprising, you know, for independence. Um, some people, I think, have started calling it the Cedar Revolution too. Though I think people, yeah. people, a lot of people liked that. And so, what happened to that uprising? Um, well, it it went on for a long time. Um, the you know the the uh, number of government figures resigned. Um, it had a lot of effects, I think, in the beginning, um, and it definitely had a big ripple effect. Um, and it changed the way a lot of people thought, I think, about their government, and it gave Lebanese people a sense that they they could, you know, they could stand up to their government, they could protest, um, and it made them feel like they could change things. Uh, unfortunately, what what happened afterwards was that a lot of the sort of same old faces and and sort of usual suspects started coming in and reasserting control. And I think people were very disappointed by that. Mm. Um, the Speaker of the House is uh, Nabih Berri, whose name you may recognize from the Lebanese Civil War. Yeah. Um, he's the Speaker of Parliament. And he, he, he sort of came in and reasserted his control and a number of the other sort of political, a lot of them old warlords from the Lebanese Civil War, came in and reasserted their control over the uprising. In fact, toward the end of the uprising, a lot of the flags that you saw on the little, yeah. you know, the nice little banners and stuff like that, a lot of those were paid for and produced by the political parties. Even even at the beginning, they sort of started coming in and saying, this is what you're going to say, and this is what you're going to do. And and, uh, and so it wasn't, it very quickly went from being people power to being, to being manipulated. Party, party power. Yeah. And so are there, insert, are, are there people who belong to the, who participated in those uprisings that are really future leaders and, um, and are they sticking to it or is it something that just went away? I think there are a lot of potential yeah. future leaders for Lebanon in, the, in that yeah, uprising I and, I, and I think the, the real test of whether this was a, you know, was a real sort of watershed f for Lebanon will be if they can break into the political system, yeah. which has always been very dominated by a few sort of, uh, everyone always says, you know, there are 30 families that run Lebanon. It's very almost feudal system where these families have a tremendous amount of influence. And so they've historically a lot of times sort of passed their political office from one member of the family to another. Now you also mentioned uh, the influence of Syria. Yeah. And we were starting to talk about Syria. But before we want mm -hmm. to go, I just, I, I long for a picture of what life is really like having never been <laughs> basically to either the Sir Lebanon or to Iraq. If you're walking down the street in Beirut and you want to buy a blouse, mm. um, are there a lot of stores to buy it in? Oh, yeah. And do you feel as free as you do here? In some ways more. Yeah. In some Why? ways more so. Um, Beirut is really a cosmopolitan city. It's, uh, it's very open. Um, women dress astoundingly in Beirut. I mean, I actually, it's funny, because now that I'm back here in New York, everyone's like, wow, you're wearing so much makeup. You look so glamorous. And <laughs> in Beirut, I'm totally frumpy. Um, a friend of mine, a Lebanese friend of mine, uh, used to say that, you know, there were certain, he always felt at home in, uh, in neighborhoods in New York where women dress, like, really, you know, flashily. Right. And, you know, is like, it comparable to Rome or Paris? Yeah. It is. Yeah, just in terms of, you know, you walk down the street, you hear a number of different languages. That's in some neighborhoods. Yeah. That's like in the downtown. And yeah. then there's other parts of other parts of town, you know, that are much more sort of village-like and, and much sort of... And do we have some of our worldwide companies there? So you see the same oh, stores? Yeah. Body Shop, yeah. Starbucks. Benetton, all these different yeah. things. And, and in Baghdad, it's not as cosmopolitan. Well, in Baghdad, 
it's funny because <laughs> you see a lot of cigarette ads, in fact. <laughs> the cigarette mm -hmm. companies got in there right away because like, they, they wanted to establish the market and establish sort of brand loyalty right away. So it's, it's the weirdest thing. You're driving around and you see an ad for Davidoff, which I don't think we have those yeah, here, but yeah. um, it's this very sort of suave James Bond looking yeah. guy, and, and it says, The more you know, <laughs> and they're <laughs> everywhere. And you have a scene of like, you know, are they long, chaos. thin cigarettes? I don't I'm know why. Bad. I think, I don't know. You Something don't like that. Right. Yeah. Is there a Department of Health in Baghdad? I do smoke when I'm in Baghdad. <laughs> oh, do? You? Is there a Department of Health in, in Iraq or in Baghdad? Yeah, there's Baghdad? a health ministry. Yeah. There is yeah. a health ministry. Now let's, now, let's shift to Syria. Okay. Um, Syria has always been a controlling influence in Lebanon, or not always, in the last how many years? Since the Civil War, which um, was in 1975 to 1990, roughly. Um, and, and Syria intervened early, you know, right, right in 1976. Um, and they essentially brokered the, the peace agreement in part. Um, and, and have sort of been a controlling interest in Syria ever since. And and the, the really funny thing about it, and I was talking in the last show about Samir Kassir, who's the Lebanese journalist, very who courageous is? journalist, who was, who was assassinated in a car bomb. Um, and he, he always points it out, uh, as, as he always says, you know, if, if there's democracy here, it'll be despite America, not because of it. This gets back to what I was saying about people having long memories. The American government actually at the time supported Syria's sort of takeover of, of Lebanon because it was in our interest because it you know it would help promote regional stability and so there's a there's a there's a long history there you know at the time we essentially gave them the green light and and said okay go you know go ahead and do what you have to do um, and ever since then Syria was the controlling interest politically it was the main power broker in Lebanon and so it controlled a lot of what went and on why in are government. they interested in it is it is it a, because is it a center for banking and commerce and it is, and it has always been a sort of, um, I think the phrase that Lebanese people use is cash cow um, for, for Syria. And um, it's they always... They invest in it, in different companies and things there? Well, um, yeah, and there's also just sort of government contracts and, um, you know, government, government in, in a, lot of, a lot of Middle Eastern countries, government itself is a sort of cash cow. Um, and there's a lot of sort of tourism uh, in Lebanon, and, and that's very lucrative. Taxes are really high. Um, gasoline tax is 50%, and a lot of that goes through the government. Um, and, and so there's a lot of different ways of sort of skimming off. Now let's talk about Syria. Okay. Describe Syria. <laughs> Syria is actually, I, I was shocked by how um, cosmopolitan, there's that word again, yeah. how cosmopolitan Syria was, because I expected um, you know, it's a police state, and yeah. it's a really bizarre mixture of a police state where you see Hafez al-Assad, who is the former dictator, um, and, and Bashar, his son. You see portraits of them everywhere. Um, you see um, sort of very concrete evidence of control everywhere you go. And I was talking to a lot of dissidents when I was in Syria, and you would you'd see these very obvious spies sort of sitting there at the next table <laughs> pretending to read the paper, in some cases two or three. In some cases they wouldn't even pretend to read the paper, they would just sit there listening. <laughs> um, so there's a very overwhelming sort of evidence that you're, you're being What's watched. The, what is the government in Syria? Yet at the same time, I'm, I'm just going to finish that, at the oh, same yeah. time you see a lot of Americans and a lot of foreigners. Um, there's a lot of Americans there studying Arabic, um, and it's a very tourist-friendly city. Strangely enough. Yeah. So it's this bizarre mix of a dictatorship, yet very tourist-friendly and open to the rest of the world. Yeah. So what's the form of government? Um, well, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's funny because I actually read an article about this. It's, in theory, it's a multi-party government. So they have multiple political parties, but they're all pretty much controlled by the main party, which is the Ba'ath which is, uh, has similar origins to the Ba'ath Party that was in Iraq, although they split and they then hated each other. Um, but the Ba'ath Party <laughs> was founded by a Syrian Christian, uh, Michel mm -hmm. Aflaq. And, um, and so they have a clause in their, in their constitution um, that says that the Ba'ath will be the leading party in society and the state. And basically it means that they're in charge. <laughs> is there a parliament? There is a parliament. It's and not then, very effective. But and is there a prime minister? Yes. 
Um, and well, there's the president. I think there's a prime minister. It, it's kind of like Egypt, where there's a prime minister, but nobody really knows his yeah. name, or, or and, he doesn't really and do anything. The president is the one that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And the president is the one who really controls um, controls the state and controls everything. Um, and, and there's who's been, the president? He's Bashar Assad, who's yeah. the son of Hafez al Assad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's been a big debate in recent years um, over how much he really controls because there's a sort of inner circle of influential people whose names you might not even know who control the government in, uh, in Syria. And there was always a, a, a sort of myth or a, a storyline that he wasn't really, Bashar wasn't really in control, that Hafez was really in charge of the government, but then he passed it on to his son, and his mm. son wasn't really equipped to control this old guard and this mm. inner circle that really ran the country. And I think what we saw over the past several months, there was a big Ba'ath Party Congress in, in Damascus a couple of months ago. And Bashar came in and fired a lot of the old guard and sort of shuffled them around and really reasserted control over the country. And so we, were, we don't really have that view anymore that he's not really in control. Um, and, and so it's, it's an interesting... Is he a Christian or a Muslim? They're Alawites. Um, and what is that? It's a, it's, a sect, it's a sect of Islam. And whether or not it's an offshoot of Shiite Islam sort of depends on who you're talking to. Um, but uh, it, it's a minority, which is the important thing. Uh, Syria is a Sunni majority country um, ruled by this religious minority. It's very influential. And so uh, the idea that you have to sort of control the society and control the Sunni um, sort of Sunni spirit in the country is, is a very, it's a very so big one. So is that why we have the feeling, of the, is there a connection with the Sunnis? Oh, absolutely. And the rebellion, absolutely. the Sunni uh, terrorists. Yeah, absolutely. That's it. That's absolutely. It. There's, a, there's a lot of, I think a lot of, a lot of people passing through Syria who then mm -hmm. do go on to Iraq, mm -hmm. um, which has been a big sticking point between Syria and, and the United States. Um, and there's just a lot of, um, there's just a lot of sort of traffic back and forth. There always has been. Um, and um, there was an uprising among Sunnis in, in the 80s uh, and the Muslim Brotherhood, um, which also exists in Egypt. Um, was this was a, in Syria? This was in Syria. And Hafez al-Assad put it down in an absolutely savage uh, manner, killing nobody really knows how many people, but probably about 10,000 in one particular town. Um, and so in Syria, there's definitely always been a fear that that will happen again. And with Iraq next door, that fear, I think, has definitely been rekindled. And so you see a lot of Iraqis believe that Syria is meddling very directly in Iraq. Um, the American government believes that as well. Um, the Syrian government denies it, but they, uh, you know, in Syria, it's very hard to tell what, what the truth is. <laughs> in fact, I, I always ask people in Syria, well, how does your government work? Mm. And nobody really knew. <laughs> you know? yeah. It's really... And it placed Syria, I don't mean, I, this sounds so ignorant, but oil. What's the role of oil in Syria? Syria is under a tremendous amount of economic pressure right now because it has oil, but the oil is going to run out. And everyone knows it's going to run out, and it's going to run out in less than 10 years. And they're going to need another source of income. So another reason for their interest in exactly. Iraq. Exactly. Exactly. Well, in Iraq and also in Lebanon. In but Lebanon. Yeah, definitely in Iraq and, and sort of maintaining, yeah. you know, and, and building economic ties in Iraq. Right. So you've been in this country uh, during the hurricane, the yeah. Katrina hurricane. <laughs> yeah. And um, I, when I watched it, I couldn't help but think about Iraq because I just with the electricity and everything. Yeah. But what do you think the impact is? Have you spoken to people about it, or do you? It's astounding to me. I mean, I'm just I'm floored. I'm utterly, utterly shocked. I, I really, you know, when you travel to other countries, you really get this appreciation for America because you see. Yeah. Relative lack of corruption, yeah. you know, day-to-day -day lives, you know, you can do things that you can't do. I wanted do. to ask you about that, actually. Yeah. Coming back here, let's just take a pause about Katrina. Coming back here, you feel what you're saying, you, you, you begin to have a, a different appreciation you of can, the simplicity or directness of life. You can say what you mean, and Americans really do more or less speak their mind. Aside from George W. Bush <laughs> <laughs> and, and well, Cheney. Well, yeah, he speaks his mind, but... <laughs> yeah, but they don't say what they really mean, I don't think. I don't know well, what I they do. Well, I think Bush does, but... <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, but but you, you see that, um, and it's really, it's really a relief. That's the one thing that's really a relief, where you sort of, you can immediately say what you think. And, and Do you think we're really naive? 
here. I always had the feeling when I came back, especially from Europe or other places, that there's, there's a naivety about us here. Yeah. Well, um, Simplicity Iraqis, of life. In Iraq, people always would, would think that, you know, that the American, they would always say, ah, oh, this is an American plot, and they're doing these suicide bombings, and they're sponsoring the terrorism, and, and it's a way to make this happen, and then that happen, and they always had some elaborate yeah. plot that they thought the Americans were up to, and I would always tell them, you know, we're really not that sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> right. We can't do that. We yeah. don't usually think that far in advance, you know. And I think Katrina, and it's just, it's it stuns me because I always wonder what they're thinking. If if uh, 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 there's a good friend of mine here from Iraq, actually, he's on a Fulbright, and uh, and uh, he, he's Kurdish. He's from Kurdistan, and and I think he was just really shocked to see how to ineffective we were. Yeah, and, and I wonder and, if unable. people in Baghdad who are so angry over America's inability to. Um, you know, to get the lights on after two and a half years. I wonder if they're seeing this, and I wonder if they're a little less mystified now. Because America, and this is a really serious problem in Iraq, um, you know, people in Iraq would always tell me, I'd hear this again and again, America, you know, if they're not turning on the electricity and the water, it's because they don't want to, because America is like this great country. It's a superpower. They got rid of Saddam. They did all this stuff. And, you know, if there must be some plot. They must be doing it on purpose. And I would always say, no, don't underestimate, you know, there's not a lot of troops on the ground. And yeah. yeah, well, don't don't underestimate, you know, the stupidity of the American public. <laughs> well, in this case, I think it's don't, don't, you know, don't overestimate what our government can do. Yeah. And I think Katrina is really a case in point. That we haven't been able, that, and then we say how long it'll be before we put the electricity or any of these things on. And we, the thing is, we do have the capacity. We yeah. do have the capability. You know, we've we've built dams. We've we've done yeah. a lot of things. We've gone to the moon. We put a man <laughs> on the moon, and and the we sad the... thing is, we could have done it, yeah. and just in just and in Iraq as in Louisiana, we could have done it. There was a plan, you know, and you see the same pattern with this administration, where you know everyone says the administration didn't have a plan in Iraq. That's not true, actually. There there were there are a number of very good plans, you know. If you look at the future of Iraq report, which is put together by Iraqi exiles in the State Department, it's a very clear plan. There were there were a number of plans. We just didn't follow them, and it was the same thing in Louisiana. The Army Corps of Engineers had a very concrete plan. We just didn't follow it. Why didn't we follow the plan in Iraq? What was the plan in Iraq? <laughs> This I think I think there were a number of plans yeah. in Iraq. I mean, I, I what did they entail? I have some friends in the military, and and you know, when you talk to the military, their their point of view is, you know, had we just put the military in charge, we, we would be in a lot better shape. I think I personally think they're right, but yeah. maybe I'm pro-military in that way. <laughs> um, but I mean, I think if you look at the the American military, it does it is you know it can do wonders when it just goes in there and 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 builds things, um, and. Had we done that, maybe we'd be, we would have been in better shape. But you know, you had a number of plans in the first days after the war. You sort of, you know, you had civilian plans. You had uh, civil battalions of military units. You had sort of a number. And then you had Bernie Carrick showing up, <laughs> and he's still around. He didn't stay for very long in Iraq. Was it was his ineptness that obvious there? I. He he himself was really not that obvious there. I yeah. don't think I, I don't think no. he actually spent. But he obviously a lot didn't prove to be inept because then the president nominated him to be head of the Homeland Security <laughs> Administration, which was beyond <laughs> anything. But I you, look at how secure our homeland is. Yeah, and you see the <laughs> the network news still have him on as an expert and a commentator. Do they discuss in Iraq, um, and especially I guess after Katrina, and you haven't been there, but race and uh, and poverty? Do they know about that existing here? No. Uh, people in Iraq have very weird ideas about America. People, the one prevalent idea that people have is that the army, the people in the army are all Jews. I heard that again and again. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, it's they, so get, funny. they get these ideas and they just, this country has been really shut off from the rest of the world for pretty much 20 years. It Why was, do they think the army is all Jewish? Oh, that is. You. That is such a <laughs> funny concept. This was a, sh a Sunni, a Sunni sheikh, um, and he had a lot of weird theories. Yeah. <laughs> that was only one of them. Um, and he actually, I, uh, it was an interesting conversation. Did you I, write? Is he the sheikh who wrote, who talked about Marilyn Monroe? No, that was a that was a different guy. Oh. That was a different guy. I had a lot of interesting conversations in uh, in, uh, yeah. in Iraq. But no, this guy. Um, he had gotten that idea probably from, you know, some Arabic language yeah. media or maybe from some other, you know, religious, maybe from right. some mosque somewhere. Right. And what else do they think? Do they, they don't, 
they don't think anybody's poor? I think, I think they have a vague idea, you know, that there's sort of different classes and different levels, and they get a sort of very garbled view of things. Um, they definitely, they're definitely hip to the whole idea that the Pentagon and the State Department were fighting. Oh, that's interesting. It is really interesting. I mean, you know, the thing is, like, they're not dumb, but they've been fed so much misinformation right. over the past 20 years that things come out in this very garbled form. A lot of people watched uh, Fahrenheit 9-11. Yeah. They got it on these little bootleg DVDs mm -hmm. actually quite quickly after mm -hmm. it came out. And I think they had a bad translation because you would hear these weird versions of things from people like, you know, Bush's brother runs Fox News and, and things like that. Like, sort of, not really. Um, yeah. And you hear that a lot. Um, one guy who uh, was a good friend of mine, he was a really sweet guy, he, he, um, he wanted to write to John Warner, uh, who's the head of the Armed Services Committee, committee. who's a ranking right Republican the on the Armed Services Committee. Virginia, yeah. And I think people have this idea that um, business is done in this face-to-face -face way, that it is done that way in Iraq. It's very personal. It's all about your sort of personal relationships and what pull you have and who you know. And so people would always ask me, as a reporter, they'd always ask me, well, do you know George Bush? That's and I would say, no, I haven't, you know, I haven't had the pleasure, uh, you know, and they would say, tell George Bush that, you know, yeah. Because I would, when I first got there, I would tell people I was American. I, I, I stopped, you know, stopped doing that shortly. But they would pretty much usually figure it out. And they always think that, you know, journalists are sort of part of the government because in Iraq they are. And uh, do they speak? Did, were you able to speak English to a lot of people? A lot of people spoke English in Iraq. I mean, it tends to be the the older generations. Um, and I speak a little Arabic, not enough to conduct interviews, but enough to sort of have like a polite conversation yeah, with people. So, um, but a lot of people, like sort of older generation, who were allowed to travel before Saddam really started cutting down on travel and contact with the, with the rest of the world, a lot of those guys speak English. Now, there is an emerging cultural world, is there? In, yeah. I think the, the, the cultural world sort of stuck its head out and started to emerge, and then it very quickly <laughs> sort of pulled, pulled it back in. Um, and just the rampant assassinations, it, you know, is really the the really, um, it started to really take its toll uh, in the beginning of last year, in the beginning of 2004, and it's just gotten worse and worse right. over the past you year. Wrote a, you wrote a column about a young man who's doing a film. Mm -hmm. And uh, the oh, story about how he got the film. <laughs> <laughs> the film is how old? The film is something like 15 years old or something like that. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was quite old. And uh, he it had been looted from from the telecommunicate from the information ministry yeah. <laughs> and then sold in the thieves market and he just he went and bought it and people who would sell film actually for the silver because yeah, um, it, yeah. it was actually old silver nitrate film and um, and so they would sell it and he he bought as much of it as he could and it's very very past the date and so he uh, he's an amazing guy he was very persistent he emailed Kodak he went face to face right he went face to face exactly <laughs> right. exactly and yeah. and and for him it worked which is yeah. amazing that it worked it didn't work for my friend who was trying to email John Warner um, <laughs> but, but he went face to face and um, he he found a, a an email address, you know, I think probably for you know publicity person or something like that on the Kodak website, and he said, "Hey, can you help me? I'm in Iraq and I want to make this film, and I, the film's really old and I don't know what to do." And and so Kodak actually donated uh, the processing yeah. for, for the film, and and that just that shows you what a persistent guy he was. I mean, he was amazing. So is the film finished? I think he's. I think it is because I, I just got an email that it had won a, a, a jury prize in a Singapore film festival. Oh, great! I haven't seen it yet. Is it coming here? I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I can't wait to see it. Yeah, and are there there writers? I mean, are there? Is there? Are there, is there a free press? Do there, there is the, the beginnings of a free press. Now, it's arguable how free it is because journalists keep getting killed, um, and. The insurgency, um, you know, one of the sort of terrorist tactics that they've adopted is killing, uh, you know, killing people who are prominent in sort of social and cultural life and political life. A lot of politicians have been killed, um, and, and it tends to be the ones on the sort of lower rungs, like the local, active in local government. Um, because Anybody who's vulnerable. cooperating or trying to create a, a yeah. stable kind of government or well, They've also anything. managed to kill people yeah. at pretty high levels yeah. of government uh, as well. Um, and killing journalists is part of that. Now, let's talk about Al Qazir. I don't understand that. What, what is Al Qazir? Isn't that what you call it? The news service Al Qazir? Oh, Al Jazeera? Al Jazeera. Yeah. What is that? 
Um, Algecira is, uh, it, it means the island, yeah. um, and it's, it's based on Qatar, um, and it was set up by uh, people from, um, who used to work for BBC's Arabic service, which was discontinued. And so it was the first Arabic satellite channel that um, took a sort of news, newsy approach, um, which a lot of them had learned. In, and in is it BBC. independent? Well, except when it comes to Qatar. <laughs> um, and and that's that's sort of a lot of a lot of here's the, the problem with with calling press in, in the Arab world independent is that it all is funded by somebody, um, and so you have Al Arabiya is funded by Saudi Arabia, and so you know you could say you could say that it's independent, but you know it's arguable how independent it might be when it comes to covering Saudi Arabia, and you have Arabic satellite channels based in. Um, based in Iraq, do you think and they're independent. And do we have any control over it? I mean, it was fascinating to me with its role at the Republican convention. Well, it, it's arguable how much control the American government can wield, but we, you can wield influence yeah. um, with the media. And I think the Bush administration has been quite skillful in wielding influence through access um, and through sort of saying, well, we're not going to let you talk to you know, X, Y, or Z people. Um, and the Iraqi government for a while um, cut them out of the loop and wouldn't let them operate from, from Iraq as well. Um, and in, in, in part, I think that was because uh, that they had become the network of choice for terrorists. Whenever they would do an attack, they would send them tapes. Um, and I think there was an argument um, that, you know, by showing these tapes, they were encouraging people to do that, to do that sort of thing. Mm. And, and Arabia was doing that as well. Right. And so you sort of had this thing where they would try to one-up each other, and whenever somebody got a terrorist <laughs> tape of, you know, somebody's head being cut off, they would play it. Yeah. Because it was considered quite a coup. Right. And so, yeah, so, yeah. so we're at the end of the second program, and I thank you very much. <laughs> you said you started out not being interested in the Middle East, but it seems to me like you've fallen <laughs> in love with it. Is that true? Yes. All right. <laughs> Good luck to you, Anya. This is Adlo. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for pronouncing my name right. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.